Oh, this you guys fire away. I feel like I just talked to you yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> How's uh, it looking for, I guess, DeAndre, maybe for some of the other guys that were question marks? Are they going to be at yeah. practice today? Um, yeah, we should have guys. They should all be at practice, and we'll see how much they do. Um, we'll see where they're at. So they're guys that I'm, I'm, uh, feel pretty good about, but can't make any guarantees at this point. So we'll see how it goes. What have you seen from Hop so far from he's coming back? Same guy. You know, he looks like looks like Hop. Um, he's been great. He's been really communicative about you know how he feels and where his body's at, and and making sure he's getting to work to be ready to play. Um, so everything he's done has been exactly what we're looking for in terms of communication and, and process. So um, that's been positive. What's your thing about how a guy practicing or not practicing during the week and playing on Sunday, and how much does it vary for a veteran? Uh, it, it, that's it's case by case. I think is is how it usually works. I mean, obviously you'd love to have them practice at least once before the game. Um, I generally think that's a a safe bet to feel like they're ready to play. But there's definitely been weeks where a guy's been dealing with something that uh, lingers. But you know, by the 48 hours from Friday to Sunday, they they got a shot to be ready to roll. So um, generally speaking, give guys as much opportunity to, to play as possible. I'll never rule anybody out if they haven't practiced. Um, Unless it's like a clear, they're not going to play. But for the most part, if they if they think they can make it, and we can try to make it go, uh, you know, pregame workout or whatever. Uh, if they haven't practiced and they've played enough, usually I feel pretty good about it. Different than if it's a younger player who maybe hasn't had the experience, and then I'd, I'd be a little bit more leery of of a guy not practicing. You did the captains last week. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think this team is from a leadership standpoint, and were there several? Several guys that were maybe yeah. close that could have been captains. Yeah, those the the guy the five that were elected captains were pretty. Uh, they were the five were substantially more than than anybody else. But we had a handful of guys get a handful of votes, so you can tell that there's some some guys growing in their roles, uh, guys growing in leadership. Like the, I, I named Calvin as the as the sixth captain um, at that dinner. I don't know if that got out, but Calvin will be the sixth captain. Um, he was the sixth highest vote getter. Um, so that was a, a little bit of an honor for him to be able to walk out there. That sixth captain spot will be one that um, I'll use at my discretion. Um, there'll be some ways that we'll use it. But Cal Calvin will be the sixth, and he was the sixth highest vote, vote getter. Um, and there was a handful of other guys that, that were that were in the same ballpark. So that's a good thing to me when you got a lot of guys that, that get votes because uh, that means there's, there's multiple leaders in our team. And when we elected captains and I told the team, um, that everybody still carries a leadership role. And I still need everybody to, to lead in their own ways. And just because you don't wear the C uh, doesn't mean that you're not the, the, your leadership isn't valued. And, and we got a lot of guys that have worn that patch before. You know, Tyler Boyd's worn it. Cheeto's worn it. Um, Ernest Jones has worn it. Uh, Quandre's worn it. I mean, we got a bunch of guys that have been captains other places that are part of our, our growth as a team together will be as you start to see those guys more and they get to know each other. Um, those qualities should come out too. So. Or he's, he's a captain this week. He's a captain this week. It, uh, our sixth captain will be a, a weekly captain. Dylan Raidens, I know you didn't have the perspective of knowing him in previous years, but once he moved forward and claimed the right guard job, what, what was his demeanor like through that process? Because it's kind of been up and down for him for three years. I think the cool thing is it's been consistent, and that's to me the mark of, of a guy that's ready to step into that role is that you know he didn't he didn't flinch during the competition. He competed hard. Um, he practiced hard, and then when he was, you know, named as a starter, he he didn't change anything about how he approached it. So, I like to see the consistency in the approach. That to me uh, is the mark of a guy that's that's matured and ready to take on that kind of role. Um, so that was really positive to see is that he was the same guy uh, throughout the entire process. Someone who's seen impact of some pretty good three receiver sets. What's the potential impact of this group once everybody's completely healthy? Ready I feel great about it. I think there, there's. It's a good mix. They're guys that have played a lot, so they know how to play. Um, but you got you mix Tyler's instinctiveness um, and feel with Calvin's explosiveness and uh, D Hop's experience and ability to make strong catches. Um, it's it's a really good group that I think has a chance to um, you know be one of the better trios of receivers in football. And and again, we got to go prove it and got to go earn that. But um, you know, on paper so far. Uh, it, it looks good to the public eye, uh, but it, it's also looked good to me in practice. And so I, I see the potential, um, but again, we got to go out and do it. In your experience working with three guys who could be number ones, like mm -hmm. how tough is it to manage, making sure they get their touches early, get them involved? Um, thankfully, I have had that experience, so it's not very tough. I think you, if you're not used to that, um, it can be probably challenging for some guys. Uh, been been fortunate to be around good enough players for a lot of different years in a couple different spots that um, you get used to how to manage that. Um, you make sure everyone's got things in the game plan. You make sure their primary is on what they're good at. 
Um, you move them around the formation. You put them in spots to catch the ball. It's uh, it's a process, and we work really hard at it. I mean, we we spend time on where we're putting guys and how we're asking them, uh, what we're asking them to do. So that part um, is not new. It's something that I've I've done for a long time, and feel pretty confident that you know we can get guys the ball. And again, I love that. I love when receivers come to the sideline and tell me throwing the ball because that means that uh, they want it, and you want guys that want the ball. And so it's my job to get it to them. Have you found in the past like that has been something you have to do, like? You take Chase, you, you know, how you, mm -hmm. you got to get him involved early. Have you found in the past that that to be the case? Um, yes and no. I think it depends on the player. Um, I think what's unique about those guys in Cincinnati was just how um, unselfish they were. Um, they did. They, they understood that they were going to get their opportunities. And I think we have the makings of a similar mindset here. Guys that, you know, that sometimes, you know, Calvin's going to require to get somebody to get another guy open. He's required to get TB open. TB's going to help get Calvin open and, and so on and so forth. So when you got a group that works together and knows that their, uh, their opportunities and touches will come, um, they tend to do a pretty good job of, of playing together. And that's ultimately, I think, what separates the best groups is guys that understand how to work together, that they're all going to get their opportunities. With your determination to get the ball out quick a lot, how important is it for guys to make people a, a, a guy miss? And how important is yak to this offense? Um, I think it's important to every offense. Ours, it's important to ours too. Is that when you guys get the ball in their hand in space, that the expectation is that there's going to be someone there, uh, and their job is to let their talent take over, um, and and make a guy miss or break a tackle. Uh, that's that's a part of I think good offenses uh, force missed tackles, and I think that that's a huge part of of football in general. But for sure, us as well. We're going to put guys in space, and they're going to get one on ones, and they're going to be um, out there to be tackled by somebody. And and their job, what we pay them to do, is to break that tackle or make that person miss. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a big part of, I think, offensive football in general nowadays. tackle breakers you feel like you have? Well, we're going to find out. I feel pretty good so far, but we haven't had a whole lot of live tackling exposure yet. Um, I know what the guys have been in the past, but, again, every, news, every year is a new year, so we're going to find out. You mentioned your excitement level just with this new role, new team all throughout the offseason, but now that it's finally your first week as a head coach going into your first game, how would you kind of – describe the emotions and how you're feeling after working up to this moment the last seven, eight months. Yeah, I think it's 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 been really – I've had a ton of fun um, in the last couple of days because now we transition from, from training camp and into the regular season, and I enjoy the game planning process. I enjoy getting ready for games. Um, I enjoy the installs and the teaching of the plan and, and the installation of the plan. That part's really fun for me. So I'm kind of back at home now. It's, I feel a lot more comfortable in a game planning process maybe than uh, standing up here in front of you guys all the time. But um, that part's been fun. I've really enjoyed I've, I've, I've had a blast. Um, and there's been a lot of enthusiasm, I think, from everybody in our building um, getting ready for the game. But that part's been, I feel back comfortable back at home game planning again. So that's exciting. When it comes to your rookies, uh, Brian, is there anything you do this week, especially with those starters, extra conversation with them just to kind of prepare them for, for this first big game? Um, I think it's the same for everybody, you know, every first game. And it's, it's, about, it's, it's about not trying to do too much. Um, it's do, do what's asked of you. Do your job well. Um, but but don't, we don't need anything spectacular. You know, when a play comes to you, make it. Um, if your job is to block a guy, block him. Um, try to keep it as narrow focused as you can and not and not worry about all the outside stuff. It's still football at the end of the day. Uh, most of these guys have been playing football their whole life, so it's, that part's not new. It's the uh, it's sometimes the atmosphere and the intensity of it, and so you just try to make sure they understand that uh, they're just they're one of eleven on any given play, and then whatever their job is on that play, that um, just focus on doing that, and the rest of it generally takes care of itself. You know you're preparing for your, your first game, and things rarely go exactly as they're planned. Is that where, in particular, you can lean on the veteran nature of your assistants on your staff? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's every game is like that. You know, you, you go in with a plan, and sometimes the plan is exactly how you expect, and sometimes uh, it's entirely different, or they uh, you 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 have an issue personnel-wise, or it's it's always something. And I think the best staffs in football adjust quickly, um, and they're able to adjust quickly, and they're flexible, and they adapt. Um, and that's what experience gives you. And you've, they've done it so many times over so many years that um, they don't flinch. They know they know when to pivot and when to adjust. And uh, I will lean heavily on those guys uh, in all their all their roles uh, with the veteranness that they, they know how to handle a game day and and usually what comes with it, which is you know half of the game you probably had uh, no plan for at all, and you have to find a way to figure it out. You and your coaches and your players. I'll come, I'll come back. Sorry, it's you've all alluded to the strong running identity of your mm -hmm. team and how important that is to you and you. Were, 
talking on the OTP, I guess, a couple of days ago about using EPA per play as yeah. a way that you measure that. Yep. When you look at last year, for example, I believe three teams were plus EPA per play in the run game. So how do you kind of reconcile the efficiency of those plays with making that a part of your identity? Sure. I, you know, I think the, the caveat to that is that obviously throwing a ball is always going to net you a higher EPA. Um, that's just how it usually works. Um, but you try to make sure that when you're running it, you're running – the right schemes into the right looks that you're not necessarily forcing into into bad spots and, and it's never perfect trust me there's there's a million plays over the course of a season that that you wish you didn't run in that particular look or you ran the other way you saw the pressure whatever it is um, but you try the best to avoid negative plays um, and you try your best to generate explosive ones and, and if you're in that box you're usually going to be uh, flirting with a positive uh, epa percentage most of the time um, at the end of the day, all that means, though, really is that when we run the ball, we're running it well enough. And you're not taking zero-yard gains or tackles for loss. You're, you're moving forward. Um, and that's sort of the general process is we, you try to get four yards. You don't always. Um, and sometimes you like to get 12 to 20, but that doesn't happen all the time either. So uh, it's a balance. It's not necessarily gospel, but it's something that we very much pay attention to. Last with your, couple uh, of With your role as head coach but also play caller on the offense, <clears throat> What's kind of your game day relationship with Denard running the defense been like and, and how involved will you be listening in on that while getting ready for the mm -hmm. next offensive series? Yeah, there's a balance there. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm focused pretty heavily on the offense during the game. I always click over to the defense. Uh, I spend time. I listen to their communication. Um, they do a great job. It's a good coaching staff. I trust those guys. Um, but I, I listen and make sure. And then if there's a point where I need to interject, uh, I will. I didn't have that happen but once or twice during the preseason, more situational. Uh, communication than anything else. Um, but I, I know their plan. I trust their plan. And I don't feel like I need to, to jump jump in there very often, just making sure I'm there for listening, communication purposes, and then and then helping where I can help. So um, that part's been really smooth. I've really enjoyed how those guys work on defense on game day so far. What were, without going and giving away too much, what were kind of the situations where you felt, felt it necessary to jump in? Uh, just, just sometimes you get locked in as a play caller. It happens to me too, um, where, you, where you're, you're, you're focused on the next play. One of them would have been, I think it was uh, at the end of the um, end of the San Francisco game, where they had like two shots left in the, the game, and and Denard had made a normal call, and they were all still really tight. It was really the last play of the game, and so it's it's like, hey, just get get all the way back in the end zone, you know, because you just kind of get locked into the moment and you lose track of some things sometimes. So that's my job is to help interject and, and make sure that they, they see the situation for what it is because I'm looking at that part um, as opposed to the play calling part. So um, that was probably one that comes to mind. I know you were, you were born in Champaign. Your dad was born in Chicago. Do you mm -hmm. still have family there that make it even more unique going back there for the Open? Yeah, we do. Um, you know, my, my mom's uh, sister and her, her – uh, uh, so my aunt and my uncle live there. Um, both of my uncles before they, my dad's brothers before they passed, they both lived there. Um, my grandmother lived there. I mean, they're, they they were tried and true Chicago family. I mean, my dad's from the south side. My mom's from the north side. They they are all uh, all Chicago. And um, I grew up a Bears fan. You know, that's that's the teams that I watched were Chicago sports teams. I was a Bears, Blackhawks, and Bulls fan, as probably a lot of people were in the '90s. Um, but that's what I grew up watching because we lived in Madison for a long time when I was a kid. And so I spent a ton of time in Chicago as a kid. Uh, it's a phenomenal city. It's a great place. And, and uh, it's a great sports town, too, on top of it. So uh, cool moment to be able to go open up uh, my head coaching career in Chicago. No, Fitting. That, I'm sorry, would you say that in terms of Will, um, more change mentally for him or more change physically, like in terms of pace and stance and things like in, in the time that you – more change mentally just because there's uh, it's a it's a much different you know it's a, it, there's a lot on the quarterback in our system he does a really good job he's learned a lot um, so that part is probably where m the more the load has been um, however I do think he's made some pretty uh, not major but significant mechanical changes in, in his body and how he moves it but he's super in tune to that part um, the mental part is where the load probably comes up the most maybe one or two maybe mental changes that, that you've seen him now that maybe you didn't see when OTAs? Uh, uh, there's a, he, he understands how to play with patience, I think, now, um, and, and understands when to, when to be aggressive and when not to, um, when to be efficient and when to complete the ball versus when to you know, maybe take a shot down the field. And so that part's been really good. He's really grown in that regard in terms of just managing the holistic 
part of the game, knowing situationally where we are, a first and 10 versus a, a third and six, a third and eight in the red zone versus a, a second and four. There's just a lot more growth that occurs, I think, for quarterbacks over time when they play a little bit more and they get to look back and study it. So that part, the situational awareness of, of when and where to do things, I think, has improved the most. Last couple on the, on the play, play sheet, I swear. Yeah. What's, what's the basis of the color coding there? And you didn't appear to be laminated yeah. in New Orleans. Is that an indoor outdoor thing? No, I uh, I like I like you I like your questions about the call sheet. I can talk about that all day. Um, no, I, I don't generally laminate unless it's, there's weather expected. I like the the feel of the paper, I guess. Um, uh, I've not laminated. I've been in the box for a long time, so maybe that'll change. But as of right now, no, I like I like the the feel of the paper, and I can mo manipulate it easier. Um, and then I would say for the color codes. Um, yeah, there is some significance to what the colors are, but it's more so it just makes it easier for me to find things. So I, I kind of know where stuff's at, and then the colors, you know, as I look at it, I know where the third downs are in the run game and the play action. So what's the response to what? what's yellow? Well, I can't give that away because now they're going to know when I look at it where I'm. They're going to have some camera on me in the sideline studying where my eyes are looking at my call sheet. Is it regular paper or is it hard? It's a card. It's a card stock. It's a thick. It's a thicker paper. Feels good on the hands. <laughs> Well, well, an important question, Details. though, for, Details. for the uh, for for the parents, the North the South side split. Did you grow up Cubs Sox fan? Did you root for both? It's a great question. I am a uh, my dad is a diehard. He watches every game. White Sox fan. It's been a really tough season for him. But he's a, he is a die. I mean, I'm telling you, he watches every game. He knows the roster. He is a tried and true White Sox fan. Um, and I grew up going to White Sox games at the old Comiskey Park when I was a kid. So, I, I, and there's been some good years, but as of late, it's been a little rough. Brian, it's been, Brian, it's been offensively, it's a limited sample size, obviously, yeah. the preseason, but you got good starts from the first-team offense mm -hmm. every time they were out there. What's the key importance of doing that? Oh, you want to start. You want to start fast, and that's that's something that we've always talked about, um, and was part of the goal of the preseason. Is even especially knowing they're going to have a limited series, is to is to start fast. Um, it's my job to put a, an opening script of plays together that puts us in position to do that, um, and then it's their job to to go execute those things. And um, starting fast, scoring first, starting fast are all things that you want to you want to get off the ground as part of your DNA. And and I think that. One of the things that we were really good at in Cincinnati was starting fast. We scored often last year on our on our opening drives, and it just puts you in a good spot. You know, there's percentages and all that on who scores first. Some of it matters, some of it doesn't. But um, generally speaking, we, we want to get get going as quick as possible and, and efficiently as possible so we can put points on the board. Yeah, you, say, you say you've been in the box for a long time. When's the last time you were on the field until this preseason? And has that been an adjustment as a play caller to be on the sideline? Uh, it has been an adjustment, yeah. It's been uh, it's been a smoother one than I maybe would have initially thought. I've been on the field probably four or five times in 15 years, um, so <laughs> it was. It's different. I get scared of the gunners. Those are the ones. I, I got to make sure I'm not. I'm paying attention. That's the new thing for me is that I can't turn my back to the field or walk. So I'm always very alert on punts. Um, but yeah, it's it's been an adjustment for me, and it's been it's gone well and been smooth. But um, seeing the defense from the field uh, is is different, much different than the box, and so um, I rely on those guys upstairs for information. But I've gotten better and better at seeing it and understanding it from the field level. Um, I do enjoy being on the field a whole lot more. The box is kind of quiet and like boring and very detached, um, as you guys know. So um, I enjoy being down in the mix and the action. It's it's a lot more fun. But yeah, it's been it's it's been a good process, but it's been a process.